You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Okay, and we're live. Welcome in, everybody. we got to let the stream breathe. You know the drill. Just for a few seconds, make sure we're nice and stable here for you tonight. Welcome into the Huddle Up podcast, everybody. Presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle and powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me, as always, my partner in crime, my fellow football priest. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, I've been dying to pick your brain on this. Friday, of course, you know, our, we, we sign off Thursday night. There's a couple of podcasts, one on Friday, one on Saturday. We missed the beginning of the true training camp on Friday where Jerry Judy is just going off the chain. Now, he started out on the second team, and most of those huge plays where he was just making people look silly on Friday happened on the second team. And then today on Sunday, for those of you listening on the podcast, Vic Fangio apparently said, I've seen what I need to see. Get this man on the first team. You had Sutton on the outside, Patrick on the outside, Judy in the slot. He already worked his way to the first team opportunity. No surprise here. He's been pretty much as advertised. You don't take a receiver 15th overall, then put him at third string or make him run with the second stringers. They knew what Judy's talent and ability is. And what we've seen on video chat from practice, he is shaking defenders out of their boots. His route running is just as crisp as we thought it was going to be coming out of college. And it's already translating over to the NFL level. Granted, I want to put a a giant preface on everything I'm going to say tonight because it is training camp. It is practice. We're talking about practice. I'm not getting too high. I'm not getting too low. I'm taking things for what they are. But based on what I've seen from Judy and KJ Hamler, these are damn good receivers, Chad. So far, so good. And our boy Hamler, who has been mostly restricted to second team, he pulled out a little bit early today, walked off the field a little bit slowly. But according to Zach Stevens of the DNVR, he's good to go. He should be back in the saddle, fully operational on Monday. So not as many Highlight real level plays from KJ. Judy has been the story in terms of the rookies up to this point. We'll talk more about the rookies and especially the offensive line. But KJ Hamler, I think what we're seeing here, Zach, is even though he was a second round pick and even though guys like Chad Ochocinco said, wow, Broncos now have three number one wideouts. I think what you're seeing early on is that there really is a big gap between the caliber of wideout Jerry Judy is day one compared to K.J. Hamler. K.J. Hamler, uber talented, very explosive. He's got some rougher points to his game he needs to kind of smooth out. However, there is quite a chasm between the polished product that Jerry Judy is the day he stepped onto the field and just the caliber of player he is compared to the more, relatively speaking, raw K.J. Hamler. And even the caliber of Cortland Sutton dropping down to Jerry Judy or dropping down to KJ Hamler. And this is why Chad Ochocinco, it was nice that he said that, but it was a little too optimistic, at least for me and for you as well. We don't think they have three number one wide receivers. KJ Hamler is still a very raw product and he looked pretty good, but he, he does need some work at the NFL level. He's had some injury concerns in college. He has to prove he can, you know, stay healthy and stay on the field. His second practice, he's limping off. It's not a great sign, but we're not panicking just yet. Jerry Judy, though, is the truth. But this is why when you have a receiver like Cortland Sutton, even if you're adding a, a talent like Jerry Judy, you could always have to go with the, with the, the finished and proven product at the NFL level. That's what Cortland Sutton is. So we get these questions about who's going to have more yards this year, Sutton, Hamler, Judy. It's always going to be Sutton. He's already proven. He's a veteran. He has experience. And it takes a while to get to where he is at the NFL level. Very true. But at the same time, you realize, you know, these reps, these players have done virtually nothing, relatively speaking, this offseason, no offseason training program. Even Sutton today had some early jitters, dropped three passes in in the early team stages of practice on Sunday, but then got his legs underneath him, vibed out with with Drew Locke, made some huge plays, including a deep touchdown in 11 on 11. Zach, real quick, I want to grab Bronx legend, bona fide superstar, Great to have you back in the streams lately, my friend. It's good to yep. see you. He said, and thank you so much for the support on Super Chat. As you know, my friend, we it means a lot to us. He says, what's the deal with Justin Sternett? Seems like he's been missing. Any news of him in camp? Mm-hmm. You know, 
<clears throat> he's a guy that's been running with the twos and the threes. As far as the rotation goes, I wouldn't worry too much. I mean, you got to remember, gang, we make a lot of uh, – we've tried to kind of posture everybody for this. We make a lot of legends out of these rookies at following the draft just because you go from the draft to many long months of nothing. It's kind of all you really have to focus on, and they get built into these legends in our minds when in reality these guys really are most of them. Not everyone could be Jerry Judy. Most of them are starting from a literal square one in the NFL, and it takes time to groove and get up to speed. And, you know, like what we've been telling you with Sternad is if you end up seeing him on the field in real action, barring any injuries above him on the depth chart this year, Zach, it's probably not going to be till later in the season, midway point and beyond, because why? It takes time for these guys to get up to speed, to assimilate, to, you know, really get their, their pro legs beneath them. So, um, there's a quote I'd like to read you, Bronx legend, from something Todd Davis said today. But, Zach, your re- reply here to our friend Angel. I-, I think you nailed that perfectly, Chad. I mean, it's all revisionist history, and it's, it's it's recency bias. All of us are so tired of having Todd Davis be a starting inside linebacker. All of us were so refreshed by seeing A.J. Johnson at the position last year because he did things we haven't seen at the inside linebacker position. So they take they get Justin Serna. They have a guy who we all think could be a three-down contributor. He can be uh, Johnson's long-term partner in crime. And we all think he's an instant starter, and this is why we pumped the brakes from day one. If he ends up starting, it probably won't be till the tail end of his rookie season. You said it best. We love these rookies, and we we dislike the players that they're, they're expected to replace. So we want them on the field. We think they're instant day one starters, but that's that's Madden. In real life, there's a big transitional period that has to take place. And even more so, we don't have an offseason. We don't have preseason. We have a limited training camp. It's been rough and brutal for rookies, and Sternod needs a lot of development at the NFL level to reach his potential. Can he in the Vic Fangio system? Yes. But is he an instant day one, you know, Patrick Willis inside linebacker? No. And that's what we're all finding out right now. Yeah. I mean, you're seeing that that's why when a guy like Jerry Judy makes the splash so quickly in training camp and jumps multiple guys on the depth chart onto the first team, it's really special because most of these rookies, even, even now with all the, you know, they've done the Zoom virtual trainings and the meetings. They've been had nothing much to do besides be in their playbook. But they're still most of these rookies, man. They are swimming right now. They're really swimming. But here's the silver lining with regard to Sternad, Sternad. I think it's Sternad. I think you were right in your pronunciation, Zach, and I was wrong with the Sternad, saying it kind of flat. Here's what Todd Davis, the first team linebacker, said about his rookie teammate. Quote, I think the speed – in the NFL, <clears throat> excuse me, everything is faster. The tight ends are faster. The receivers are faster. Everything is really crisp. I think he's doing a great job with it, though. I told him yesterday for a rookie to come in here and really face a challenging offense and really have things thrown at him really fast, he's doing a great job with it. I'm going to continue to support him. I feel like he has a lot of talent and can make us better. Close quote. So that's what Davis had to say about Sternod today, Zach, and for what it's worth as well, I know we got to get uh, our superstar Mike Evans on the horn here in just a minute or two. But for what it's worth, Todd Davis said his focus really this entire offseason, what he's really working on is to improve his coverage game. So we'll see if that comes out in the wash, but he so far sounds like he's a believer on, in Sternod, although at the same time to, to be the classical Zach Kelberman, devil's advocate. What else is he going to say about a rookie linebacker that he's a bum? I mean, if he was, right. he's not going to say that. You know, he's got talent. We drafted him for a reason. You know, he's going to, but the fact that he latched so quickly onto speed, the speed of the game, I think that kind of tells you how these veterans are viewing Stern out as that fast linebacker that can come in and make some plays. Yeah, I think it was a pretty classy response. It reminds me of how Melvin Gordon has handled the Philip Lindsay questions. It's like, what else are they going to say about their teammates? Um, but it, it's funny that it took Todd Davis up until now to realize that coverage was his deficiency and he should finally work on it this offseason. If he can, he'd be the long-term inside linebacker. We all know he's great against the run, but he's dreadful in pass coverage. And Sternad, if he can just realize his ceiling in the NFL, he can be that three-down pass covering inside linebacker the Broncos thought they were getting with Joe Drew. Rule. But Todd Davis is not an idiot either. He knows that Sternod's going to need to take at least half the season to develop, and Todd Davis knows that no one else is behind him to start, so he's locked into that starting job. Davis, though, Chad, he's not just putting film out for the Broncos. He knows his future in Denver is very tenuous. He's putting film out for 31 other teams that he wants to be a starter 
beyond just 2020. Same thing as Brandon Marshall when he left Denver. Very well said. And that's something, in fact, today, as I had our story on what Todd Davis said about the Broncos are asking a lot of him this year, I mentioned that in my in my writing is that, you know, hey, it's a lot to put on his plate. Or I shouldn't say it's, it's just another thing to put on his plate, but he's in a contract year. And the guys who get paid on the open market when it comes to the linebackers are the guys that don't leave the field on third down. If you can be that, he's already a dominant run stuffer as far as being a run-fitting, instinctual linebacker off the ball that can shed blocks, get to the to the ball carrier quickly. Todd Davis is among the NFL's best in that arena. But if he can really hone, and I don't know naturally as far as his talent goes, how far that's going to get him because we've seen him laterally moving backwards, yeah. running with tight ends. That's just not his game. But – He's got a phenomenal football brain. He, his football IQ, that's the reason why he has lasted at, and, and beat the odds as a former undrafted rookie out of Sacramento State is that football brain of his. So if he can find ways in using Fangio's own coverage to, to become that better coverage linebacker, then by all means. But, gang, be, uh, we want to get Mike here on the show in just a second. First, we got to run through some really quick matters of business. I see, Zach, we have – an outpouring of comments and super chats from the community. Yep. We're going to get to you guys here in just a second. First, we want to remind you the show and mile high huddle continue to grow exponentially. We want to make sure you all know our new listeners, our new community members, how to connect with us on social media. First and foremost, make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at huddle up pod. That's how you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show. And then also at mile high huddle. You check those two boxes, as it were, on Twitter. You're not going to miss anything podcast-related, and you're not going to miss any breaking Broncos news and analysis as we are shoveling it out in real time. And then also a gentle reminder, turn your attention over to the merch store, huddleuppod.com. Get your swag on. Get yourself one of these MHH trucker hats. You've seen Zach and I. Zach's wearing it now backwards, but the football priest hat, the Let Him Hate t-shirt has been the number one hottest seller for the last two weeks since we debuted it. A little something for everybody. Mugs, face masks, hoodies. Check it out if you get some time. Hashtag football priests indeed. It's a a great way to support what we're doing here at MHH, bringing you this content daily. And if you're not in a position to do that, it's all good. Subscribe is the biggest thing you can do, especially on YouTube. Like this video wherever you're watching, if you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, and share it out there if you really love what Zach and I are doing for you. And then one last thing, and then we're going to grab Mike. I want to tip my cap. We want to tip our cap, I should say, to our Facebook supporters. Some some familiar names as far as the superstar community is concerned. You got Poppy in there. Steve Griffith is supporting on Facebook. Jerry Holland's on there. Um, shout out to – and Roger Gutke. Shout out to the newest official supporter on, on Facebook, Jeff Hulse. These guys, we really appreciate each and every one of you for supporting us on Facebook. And it's another way, if you're interested, that's another way that you can support what we're doing here on MHH. So many of our Facebook community ask how they can support what we're doing like they see the YouTube community do. That's the simplest way. And there's a button. You go to MHH Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle. You'll see the Become a Supporter blue button. Just click that and you're there. So shout out to our supporters on Facebook. Much obliged. We appreciate your mile high salute. Much love. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. Okay. The time has come to bring on the one, the only, Mike Evans in the house. In full glory. There he is, Mike Evans. And everybody knows Mike, bona fide Super Chat superstar, bona fide MHH Mount Rushmore member. Mike, we're so grateful that uh, you made some time after I botched our August podcast schedule for the further stars. But thanks for making some some time here tonight. It's all good, and super excited to be a part of this. Thank you. You know, as we were we were uh, remarking right before we went live here tonight, you are the ninth installment of our Super Chat Superstar segment, and you will be the first. Believe it or not, those of you listening and, and with us live, Mike is the first superstar who actually is in Denver, and. As such, it maybe is not as big a surprise Mike became the Broncos fan that he is. But, Mike, if you wouldn't mind, bring us up to speed on how you became such a passionate and outgoing Broncos fan. And also, you don't have to say it now, but I'm curious to hear the details on that story of you bumping into Drew Locke and and Dalton Wright. First, how you became such a passionate fan. 
You know, I don't, you know, not many people, people know this, but my dad was a free agent for the Broncos coming out of college and uh, started his football career with the Broncos, got injured, injured his shoulder and ended up becoming an wow. Air Force officer after that. So there's been a long history with the Broncos and I'm so obsessive. I live two blocks from the Broncos stadium. So that tells you the kind of fanatic <laughs> fan that I am buying a house that close to the stadium and trying to be really a deep part of the community. Um, so yeah, I'm all chips in the middle of the table. I know, um, you know, my wife gets a little uh, frustrated with my obsession, but <laughs> I'm sure, you know, she, she, she loves me anyway. So I'm super excited to be here. Now, Mike, what was your father's name? His name is David Evans. He David went Evans. to a school in, uh, Southern university, academic, all American played offensive tackle. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right. You, Zach, I know you got some questions for him, but I'm Let's dying. Here. I, 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 go ahead. I was going to say the Broncos are in his bloodlines, Chad. His father yes. literally <laughs> is tied to the team. He lives in the Broncos' backyard. Uh, Mike, if you would, though, t- sure. like Chad said, tell us that story yeah. about running into Drew Locke and Dalton Reisner. We, you gave us a little tease about it. Yeah. Great. I was um, – I happened – my daughter and I were downtown and happened to look up, and we were at an event with pretty much the whole team, including the coaches. And um, it was surreal to say, oh, my gosh, there's Drew Locke. There's Dalton Reisner. And you see they're just – Big, huge kids. Um, you know, everyone's joking with each other, and you can see the brotherhood between them. Um, I was surprised how big Drew is. He's a big kid, long arms, tall kid. Dalton was looking him eye to eye. But, you know, what? What? not only the star thing that occurred, but really just seeing that those folks come together. Justin Simmons was there. Vaughn was there. And, and just – Everyone, it was just one community of people just coming together, just being a brotherhood. It was a special moment. I just happened to bump into. Wow. That, that's, that's what cool. jumped out to me, Zach, from Mike's story, is the bond that exists. And you can you can hear it like when – I can't think of any recent quotes anyway of, of Drew Locke talking about Dalton Reisner. But Dalton Reisner, anytime he mentions Drew Locke, you can see him kind of light up with just the kind of familiarity and affection and intimacy that comes with – being best buddies and it's just cool to hear that in person that bond it's not just something we perceive through their their public posture it's 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 for real we got mundungus <laughs> on super chat he said come on over mike can i move in with you i'll pay for my own food <laughs> come on over that'd be appreciate awesome. you that is a cool story very very cool we've got a few questions here mike from the community sure. and and uh they want to get your thoughts on some things. John, I don't know if you have anything queued up, but I wanted to, while we get this going, shout out uh, Kenneth Booker real quick. I'm looking for a comment where I can show you guys. Everyone knows who Kenneth is, but he uh, posted a really cool Denver Broncos hype video. Mm-hmm. It, he found it. Uh, uh, I don't think you made it, but you found it. If you did make it, props and, and kudos to you. But he found it, put it on uh, the in the community section of milehighhuddle.com. Gang, go check it out. It's definitely going to give you some goosebumps. We got our friend Adon, a six foot ten Mexican on YouTube, <laughs> jumping in on Super Chat. He says, You're rocking you. the show, Mike. And of course, plug in his podcast. And, and we want to support the community. Hashtag Broncos Talk. Um, one one quick one here from ZW Designs, bona fide superstar. And this is Zachary, who will be on the show with us on Wednesday night. Zachary, we're looking forward to talking with you. Yep. He says, didn't I hear that Juwan James burnt his eyebrows off while having a barbecue contest? <laughs> uh-huh. Eyebrow opt out. This, this has become a common theme. And then here's a real topic here from Jeff, Bonafide Superstar. Thanks for the donation, Jeff. He Thank says, you. hearing rumbling that the O-line is constantly collapsing on lock. This will be a rough season if that isn't addressed. He needs time to throw. Mike, one of the yes. predominant storylines that came out of t- day two, so today's uh, proceedings at UC Health Training Center – was that on Friday it was Austin Schlopman who got the first swing at being the starting center. Today it was Pat Morris, not Lloyd Cushenberry yet. Cushenberry has been running with the twos. Today was was Pat Morris, and apparently it did not go well. Everyone I talked to, and you can watch the highlights on the Broncos' uh, use, or what do they call it, training camp live, which is great. Every time they go live with camp, that show goes live. It's very insightful for those of you who can't be there. No one can be there with very small exception. But what do you read into the fact, Mike, that Lloyd Cushenberry has yet to get an opportunity to run with the ones. And so far, apparently what they've seen rotating Schlotman and Morris 
hasn't been the greatest. Yeah. I think Lloyd is the future, and I think we all realize that. I think they're just trying to, to sequence him in when he's ready. And I think that'll be probably game one or game two at the latest. But he, you know, he's got all the traits that he's got the intellect, the, the strength, the speed to, to be well at that at that critical position to protect Drew. Um, but I just think they, they're just a due process. And at the end of the day, I trust Mike Munchak. At the end of the day, he's the best at what he does, and I have faith that he'll make the right decision. But um, it's just due process is my, is my my thought on it. Zach, what's your take on it? We we briefly touched on it right before we went live here tonight. But the fact that I've I've received a lot of fans reaching out to me on social media, DMing me, hey, why is we're hearing all this bad stuff about the O-line in the center. Why isn't Cushenberry getting his opportunity? Your thoughts? I, I think Mike is spot on. I just think he said it nicer than I'm going to say it. <laughs> I don't really understand why they're wasting time. We all know, like Mike said, he is the future at the position. They don't – Patrick Morris and, and Schlopman are not the future at the center position. Cushenberry coming from LSU, he has all the traits of a Mike Munchak superstar. Why waste the time here? Let him get those reps down, Chad, with Drew Locke. To stop separating, stop breaking it up. You have to have continuity in a in a CV ruined off season. You got to get the reps in while you can. They're just wasting their time and delay, delaying the inevitable right now. And if Jerry Judy can run with the first teamers, why not Lloyd Cushenberry? Why wouldn't you want your eleven starters all working in harmony? It's inconsistent and it has to change. I think you're right, Mike. When you really boil it down, that as much as we all know, it's going to end up being Cushenberry there. Sometimes these coaches, like in the case of Jerry Judy, all the vets know, look, he's a first-rounder. It's only a matter of time this guy's going to see reps. They they come to terms with that unless the guy steps onto the field and is just completely incompetent. Like Paxton Lynch, no one's really raising an eyebrow when a first-rounder jumps a depth chart. However, in the case of everybody else, coaches have to maintain that posture that the best man's going to play. The 11 guys or the 22 guys that give us the best chance to win – they're going to be on the field, and for the sake of maintaining that faith and belief and effort in the veterans, they have to go through those motions, and sometimes good things come out of that. Sometimes, like who knows, maybe today instead of Patrick Morris kind of stepping on his own you-know-what and not having the greatest day, maybe he excels and you find a gem that you didn't realize, but it's probably only going to be, that's as we know, that's not what happened, but it's probably only a matter of time before Cushenberry uh, makes his way to the first team. It wouldn't surprise me if they give him some looks there tomorrow. By the way, KP jumping in. Appreciate your super chat. Thank you, Kevin. He says the right side of the O-line got pounded in practice. We need to get more depth there immediately. And what he's speaking to, I think, is that Elijah Wilkinson, who split some reps on Friday, on Sunday pretty much got all the first team reps at right tackle and just didn't look well. Shocker. Don't know if he's not 100% yet or what, Mike. What's your What's your take on the right tackle? Yeah, I've seen Elijah play a bunch of times. Uh, he sets up well on the pass play, and then I watch Joey Boza just kind of abuse him at, at will. So, and it's consistent. So, you know, I think he's probably a better, it's me, I think he's a better guard than tackle. I just don't think he has it. And I think he puts Drew at risk if we put if we start him. That's just, it's just my opinion. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. How quickly, Zach, are they going to be getting DeMar Dotson on the field? That was one thing that Fangio, I think it was Friday, really pumped the brakes on is that, look, man, it's going to take him some time to get oriented, learn the playbook. Yeah, okay. Team. Don't get out over your skis, but what are sure. your thoughts? Yeah, sure, Vic, sure. You're not going to have Elijah Wilkinson at right tackle. And, and today, Chad, proved the Broncos needed a right tackle who's not named Elijah Wilkinson. If they're regretting the Dotson signing at all, which they're not, they shouldn't after today. He is the week one tackle. He is the opening day tackle. And as soon as he passes the appropriate CV test, he learns the playbook, he will replace Elijah Wilkinson, and it cannot come any sooner. We got another jokester here, <clears throat> Mondungus the Wizard, jumping in. It's just e- easy target, the eyebrow thing. Jan- he says James was playing hide and seek with his eyebrows. They jumped out and scared him, and now he. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you gotta love oh, it. Oh man, bring the funny wizard. Oh man, um, we got Dave Darlington in California with the fire tornadoes. Uh, du- hope- hopefully, you're ducking Jeez. the fire nadoes, my friend, that I read about today on on uh, the internet. Appreciate your support. He says, having some vision troubles, so mostly just listening. Ah, sorry to hear that, Doc. Hope everything's okay. He says, love the pod, hashtag Cali Bronco. Well, Dave, we are friends on Facebook, so keep me apprised, man. If there's Hope everything's going okay. And uh, if there's anything we can do, we'll just keep bringing in this content, but let me know how you're doing, my friend. Uh, Jake jumping in, Gerard, 
bona fide superstar. Whenever we see him in the stream, he's showing us some love on Super Chat. And we really appreciate you, Jake. He says, Thank you, Jake. I see Judy and Hamler doing work against the second team, and I like seeing Lindsay catching the ball out of the backfield. Mm. Let's just put Dotson at right tackle so we can gel faster, not mess around. And I think that's a fair point, Mike, that, that you know, the, the whole aspect of – you, you know, you, quarterback needs to build chemistry with his skill yeah. position players. Everyone's familiar with that, but he also needs to build chemistry with his own line. So whatever the vision is that this coaching staff has for that starting five, I would think the sooner they can get that group on the field with, you know, playing together, playing with lock, the better. 100%. You know, people are reading snap counts. Those defensive players are teeing off. And people need to feel, not only hear it, but they need to feel when Drew's going to do something. And that only happens with experience. And we've had a very disconnected preseason, no preseason, um, no live meetings. We've got to accelerate things. So, I, it, you know, forgive me, but if I'm the coaching staff, I'm going to take the risk on some folks, put them together, help them gel, build that strong community and that bond. So when it gets tough, they're ready to fight for each other. Zach, I was told today, Philip Lindsay did not let a ball hit the ground. How encouraged are you by this? <laughs> wow, Chad, you mean he can catch a pass? He has hands that work? I mean, this is what we've been saying all offseason. Did you need another running back who could do that for $16 million? <laughs> Again, I'm not going to get into the Gordon discussion. I'm happy Lindsay's proving what he can do. But we all knew he's capable of that, Chad. He's done it the last couple seasons. Why the Broncos and why the fan base meant him out to see? Like, they had bricks, literal bricks for hands is ridiculous. I'm happy to see what he's doing. All right, we got uh, the queen of MHH jumping in, showing some love. Really appreciate you, Christy. Thank you. And she says, my guys, keeping it real, are you re- uh, all ready for football? I think the answer to that is absolutely can't wait. It's less than a month out. In fact, the season opener is September 14th. It'll be here before you know it. Thanks for your support, as always, Christy. Much love to you. We also got George Vandermark, wow, George. arguably the biggest Queensryche fan walking this earth, showing some extreme generosity. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate you. It's good to hear from you and see you. And he says, I'm finally back to see a live pod. George's work schedule doesn't always allow for him to be in the live streams. He listens, of course, diligently, but uh, he can't always be in the live stream. But whenever he is, he's showing us some love, and we appreciate that, George. All right. Mike, before we get out of here for tonight, we're, we're running a little bit long with you, but we sure. want to get your thoughts on, well, basically your outlook for 2020. Now, whether that comes by way of an official record prediction, yeah. how are, what's your gut telling you about this team and how 2020 is going to shake out for Drew Locke and the Denver Broncos? Yeah. I think if Dotson's the starting tackle coming out of the gates, I'd say 10 and six, worst case, nine and seven. I think, um, we're going to vastly improve in our defense. I think our offense is going to now be a threat, and defenses are going to have to play us on us. They're not just going to pack the box and, and force uh, Lindsey to run in the, in the linebackers all over the place. I think, I think we can threaten the, our uh, competitors deeply. Um, and I have to trust in Fangio. I think he's a, a, a strong coach. You guys, I watch him on the sideline. He's no nonsense. You, you know where he stands on the sideline. You know if you did well. If you didn't, you better get it right. <laughs> So I got faith in Fangio. I got faith in Munchak, Bill Kolar. I think we've got a strong coaching staff. I think um, I think we're better than the Chargers, and I think they're going to be tough. I think we're better than the Raiders, and I'm praying that we can split with the Chiefs. Man, if the Broncos really said, <laughs> look, we we talked about this last year that if the Broncos could split with the Chiefs, just one of those games, it would be almost not quite obviously in in reality, but it would feel like. The same kind of joy and just exaltation as winning the Super Bowl. It's been so long since this team has beaten the Chiefs. Last year, the Broncos swept the Chargers. They've been splitting with the Raiders for the last three, four years now, 1-1. But, man, it's been week two of the Super Bowl season, the last time the Broncos beat the Chiefs. All right, one last one for you here, Mike, is the expectations – internally for Drew Locke. And by internally, I mean within Broncos country and within Denver media at large. So include all of us here. Do you think they're setting the bar a little too high for Drew Locke? Or do you think this kid is the genuine article where the expectations are not so much as to overwhelm him on the field? What's your outlook for Locke? Uh, You know, all tips in the middle of the table for Drew because I've watched him play. He sees the field. He's got a great arm. 
And I, I, I saw something today. His feet are getting better. And that was my concern in his first preseason. His feet were all over the place. But he's planting his feet and he's throwing the ball. Now he's going to struggle in that defensive coordinators have film on him now. But I think he's talented enough to overcome that. And I was listening to his father on, a, on the radio show. And he's, he's, he's all in on football. I mean, he's a football junkie. He's raised to do this. He was bred to do this. I, I have the utmost confidence in Drew. Mike, real quick, give us yeah. a stat prediction for Drew Locke in 2020. Uh, I'd say, you know, 3,800 yards, 25 touchdowns, maybe eight interceptions. Ooh. That'd be hey, this is, great. this is, he's speaking my language. That's about exact. We're sharing a brain on that. Mike. There we go. So, Hey man, thank you for making some time for us. And thank yes. you for rolling with the punches with me on the scheduling snafu. So Gosh dang. It's been so good getting a chance to meet you. I mean, the next best thing to meet you in person, having you on the show, picking your brain on the Broncos. Mike, we really appreciate all your support on the podcast and everything you mean to this community. So thank you for spending some time with us again tonight, and we'll look forward to getting you back on the show in the very near future. Awesome. Love you all. Thank you. All right, Mike. Mike. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. There he goes, Mike Evans. Man, what a cool guy. Very cool guy. Very cool guy and knows what he's talking about, Zach, when it comes to the game of footy ball. He's very knowledgeable. Very cool anecdotes, too. One, that his father was signed by the Denver Broncos as a college free agent back in the day. And also the story about Drew Locke and Dalton Reisner are just really cool and fun to, to talk with Mike. I love that he lives literally in the Broncos Stadium backyard. <laughs> He's yeah, literally, he, he can does. throw a stone to the Broncos Stadium. Uh, very, very knowledgeable guy. Buana and I were talking about that before we went on, that he knows his S about football yep. and, the, and the Broncos. And uh, great radio voice, just an all-around cool guy. I'd love to have Mike on again. As soon as they allow fans back at the stadium, and maybe that'll be this year. We'll see. We'll see how things progress. It's not looking good right now, but – Maybe that'll be this year. If not, it's going to be next year. This, I have no doubt. And when that time comes, we're going to host a really fun get together for the MHH community. And we'll look forward to meeting Mike in the flesh when that time comes because he'll just be a hop, skip, and a jump, stone's throw (laughs) from the stadium. So I have no doubt we'll get a chance to to meet Mike one day. Um, Yes, indeed. Great job, Mike. Quick shout out to Terry. Appreciate the love, my friend, north of the 49th parallel. You exemplify our hashtag created by this community for what it's worth. State of being. Appreciate you, my dog. Um, All right. Let's see here. Thank you, George. We got George again. Okay, my friend. Um, Nishan Woodall. Now, this is not a name I recognize on Super Chat. So I think one of the one of our newer participants in Super Chat, whatever you want to call it. But Nishan, welcome. Stick around. We appreciate your support, my friend. It's good to have you. He says, what's up with Noah Fant? I haven't seen any highlights or any mention of him doing well. Hashtag Broncos in New Jersey. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'll tell you that I was told about Noah Fant today. Got a lot of work because Drew Locke, about every other play, give or take, was under pressure. And so a lot of the longer developing passing routes, they were just removed off the table and so Locke was throwing a lot of dump offs to running backs on a lot of quick outlets. And you have, you know, Noah Fant running a lot of quick outs, a lot of quick square ins, and a lot of drags over the middle where he's just a quick down. So Fant got a lot of work, and so far, so good. There's nothing we haven't heard word one that's bad about Noah Fant so far. I think you're, he's a guy that, you know, once they start doing a lot more red zone work and you start seeing right. what Pat Shermer's vision is going to be for this red zone offense, I, st- I think you'll start hearing more kind of hype and buzz about Noah Fant. But up to this point, I think the kind of no news aspect is good news. It's it's what you want to hear. And everything I've heard so far is he's looking good. And he's put on some LBs too. He's put on some weight. Claims it hasn't slowed him down at all. Claims he's his, got his speed with still and his, his quickness and all that. So I wouldn't worry about Noah Fant. He strikes me as one of those classic guys who turns it on when the lights go on, Chad. So maybe not for now. He's not standing out. But when, like you said, red zone drills, or when the games start counting, when Drew Locke's looking at him between the 20s, he's going to show up. But this is another case where Broncos fans think they're getting George Kittle or Travis Kelsey in his second season. Let's slow the roll just a little bit. He's still developing tight end. It takes a while to transition from college. And he's not, I, we've been saying this for a while, if he hasn't gotten a lot of looks in training camp so far, only two practices, let's not jump to conclusions. 
it's because he's what the fourth option in the passing game right now. There's only so many reps to go around and that's going to have a trickle down effect in the regular season. So Broncos fans expecting fans to be a 1200 yard thousand yard guy. Let's just pump the brakes a little bit. If he can get 800 yards this year and eight touchdowns, that would be a wildly successful season for Noah Fant, all things considered. thing to keep in mind about Noah Fant, too, is that when you actually get to the games and the count, you're going against real opponents, matchups are going to dictate how often he gets the ball. And when the defense is selling out to stop Jerry Judy or selling out to stop Cortland Sutton or whatever they end up picking, whatever poison they pick, right? It's going to be a pick-your-poison proposition for opponents this year. That's when you're going to see Drew Locke and Pat Shermer go to Noah Fant. And what we saw last year it, with, even though he set rookie records, franchise rookie records for receptions, his relatively s- small um, sample size in terms of actual touches, man, all three of his touchdowns, they weren't red zone touchdowns. One was a 25 yard catch and run against the Jaguars, one was a 75 yard catch and run against the Browns. And then I'm trying to remember what the third one was, but it was another long one, like 45, 50 yards. So my point being is that in practice, these guys get a dump off and their coach to just keep running down the field, kind of sprint it out in real time. Those little dump offs that are boring right now in practice, Zach, in the real games, those are the type of plays that these explosive, phenomenal, talented athletes like Noah Fant turn into big time highlight plays. So Pump the brakes, and like Mundunga says here, though, it's something interesting. Appreciate the super wizard. Bold prediction. Albert O has a better season than Noah Fant. Now, I I love the optimism on on Albert O, but that's just – hey, he said it's a bold prediction. It is bold, but I I almost don't see any way that that happens barring an injury to Fant, knock on wood. Unless Albert O is a future Hall of Famer, and we just don't know it yet. I mean, this is a guy who's a little unpolished, and it's not a great sign if a third-round pick can come out and outperform your second-year former first-round pick. They need Noah Fant to be the guy they thought they were getting. And just as you said, Chad, this is the reason I'm not jumping to conclusions with practice. I'm not going too high or too low. We haven't heard much about Noah Fant so far. Like you said, no news is good news. He will develop, and he will get better as time goes on. He'll be fine this year. For what it's worth, and this is interesting, as much as we've talked about posturing and uh, pecking orders with regards to veterans and rookies, Albert O has actually received some first-team reps. I don't read into that in the same way I read into Jerry Judy's progress. I read into that as an offense that recognizes Drew Locke has chemistry and familiarity with Albert O, not only from their time playing at, at Missouri, especially their time playing at Missouri, but also the time they spent it actually, this offseason, it actually speaks to this point, Zach, which I didn't really see coming. I honestly believed that, you know, he's a fourth round rookie, very talented, very exciting young tight end is Albert O. But I didn't think that he would probably, what's the best way to say? I didn't think he would factor into the offense very much this year. But it sounds like these coaches have a mind to get him on the field a lot more often than I initially might have had thought there with Albert Okawagman. Well, the coaches had a mind to draft him because Drew Locke played with him and probably recommended him. So they're probably going to shoehorn him in to, to, you know, assuage Drew Locke on the field and get him some reps with the guy he knew from college. I would be sh- literally shocked, though, and stunned if he had a better season statistically than Noah Fan. He's going to be a good player in the future, but Noah Fan is better right now, and he needs to be better as a former first-round pick. We got Christian jumping in on Super Chat in Las Vegas is where he hails from. Appreciate your support, Christian, as always. He says, uh, been exhausted from working till 1030 at night, but glad I can finally catch up again. Well, hey, man, hopefully you're uh, you're doing the lifeguard duty and it's all worth it for you because I know you put some work in to be able to get that certification. So props and thanks for being with us. Yeah, uh, we got Cameron in the house. Cameron, are you on Twitter? If you are, reach out and let us know who you are so that we can connect with you, follow back, and shout you out after the show. I just type your name into Twitter instead of being able to actually tag you after the show. I'd like to be able to to thank you for your support. He says, I heard Shermer is scheming Fant in some wide receiver sets opposite of Sutton with Judy in the slot. So many options. Pumped. Zach, it's interesting that Cameron brings this up. I can pull up the quote if we want to read it verbatim, but – Fant was presented to the media on Friday 
after practice virtual presser with us, and we learned that he is over the moon with Pat Shermer's offense, loves it because his OC is moving him all around the formation. Vast majority of his snaps last year, I mean, you don't need to go to all 22 right now and, and watch this to remember, he was mostly in line because that was the scheme that, that Rich Scangarello, that was his scheme. Tight ends in line, and if he goes out for a pass, usually it's on a play action, and you, you know, he's basically a big wide receiver, just like you saw Evan Ingram these last two years right. in New York. That's what you're seeing from Noah Fant, and with his speed, explosiveness, athleticism, Zach, that's a recipe for success. And as Cameron mentions here, I mean, the opportunities, the options are endless. Exactly the point I was going to make. It's the same thing. They're not really comparable, Evan Ingram and Noah Fant. Noah Fant's a little bigger, more prototypical tight end, but he can be split out wide. He can move around the formation. And it's just like moving Jerry Judy inside, outside. You can move KJ Hamler around. This offense is so multifaceted, and it's unlike anything we've seen in years, Shay. Going back to Peyton Manning's heyday in Denver, all these weapons. It's a positive and it's a good thing. It's an elite to points and yards, but only so many mouths can be fed at one time. So one dot, like you mentioned, matchup dependent, scheme dependent, game dependent. One day it'll be Judy. Next day it'll be Sutton. Next game will be Noah Fett. They're all going to contribute though to the Broncos offense this season. We got Edward Keating, a longtime supporter of the show. Appreciate your support as always. You should be getting that hat any day now, my friend, that I sent to you. Once you get it, make sure you reach out and let us know you got it. Um, he jumps in with a question. He says, did Lloyd Cushenberry and DeMar Dotson get any time with the first stringers? From what I saw today, and again, gang, watch those uh, training camp lives that are hosted every day by Steve Atwater, and then they have a guest host today. I believe it was Orlando Franklin. On Friday, day one, it was Carl Mecklenburg. Those debut, as soon as practice starts, those training camp lives go for on Facebook and YouTube, and – no fan can be there right now, and it's the next best thing. Like, we lamented, man, wish they would have just streamed the whole practice live like the Browns are doing. This is the next best thing, Zach, because the first half of these training camp lives that Broncos are doing, and kudos to Broncos PR, as I tweeted earlier today, the first half is position drills. Not a lot to see, not a lot happening. During that first section, you got Atwater and the different reporters around there going through different storylines and analyzing different things, and, you know, that's kind of take it or leave it. But the second half, Zach, once they get into p- to team uh, period and they're running 11-on-11s 11 11 and 7-on-7s, seven seven, they're filming that. So fans can see that action. It's the next best thing to be in there, so I recommend that. Um, Cushenberry, to my knowledge, has not gotten a first-team rep yet in team period, and Dotson is still a ways out from just getting thrown in there right tackle. Although it wouldn't surprise me if right tackle continues to be a sieve like it was today, Zach. Huh. They're going to have to just get him on the field because – it's either that or you pull Von Miller and Bradley Chubb aside and say, hey, man, can you tone it back so we can actually practice some offense here and get some real reps? That conversation is probably going to happen regardless because Von Miller and Bradley Chubb are so good. But no no news yet on Cushenberry and Dotson seeing first, te- first team reps. I hate that, though. You have to tell your defense not to play as hard because you don't have a right tackle you can trust. I mean, that's that's a bad look for the front office. I want all the players performing at their highest level, Shad. I want the Broncos defense coming after Lock in practice. Not hitting him, but coming after him and getting near him and simulating pressure. It's going to make Lock a better quarterback. On the other hand, though, you don't want a, a Swiss cheese at right tackle who's going to get beat, snap in and snap out, because it's going to hurt Locke's confidence in his development. So it's kind of a fine line to walk. you got to get DeMar Dotson out there. There's a reason you sign up at this stage of the offseason. Obviously, the Broncos, through all their, their public front-facing comments, they don't believe Wilkinson is a right tackle or the starting right tackle. DeMar Dotson is. The sooner he's out there, the better it will be. And Cushenberry will be the week, week one starter as well. It's just a matter of time before both guys – or in the starting lineup, Chad. Shout out to Dom here on Facebook. We definitely want to send some love to our Facebook community, 80-something thousand of you, and and we appreciate each and every one of you, Dom, and the kind words as well, my friend. Uh, Darian jumping in on Super Chat, another new name I don't recognize on Super Chat. Appreciate you, Darian. Welcome. Stay with us, my friend. Participate in the conversation. We'd love to see it. Appreciate the donation as well, my friend. He says, I know some Raider fans who think they're young DBs, will lock up our young wide receivers. Can't wait for the Raider game. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think right now that Raider depth chart, but I don't care who the like two, I don't two care players. Who, <laughs> yeah, right. I don't care who the top three corners are on an opponent opponent's defense. 
you're going to have a hard time juggling Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, and whether it ends up being Tim Patrick initially on on the field more, if it ends up being KJ, if it ends up being Deshaun, those three combined with having to deal with Noah Fant split out as a wide receiver, often like I'm going to put my money on the Broncos coming out ahead on more of those matchups than they don't. Yeah, I'm not – quaking in my boots at the Raiders defensive backfield chat. They had Jonathan Abram, the safety and Arnett, the corner. He, he's pretty good. He's going to be a good NFL player. But uh, if it was the Raiders offense versus the Broncos defense with Tyra Williams and Josh Jacobs and Darren Waller and Henry Ruggs, I could see, you know, the question being a little more realistic or at least the, the premise of what, you know, the question is saying. But in terms of the Raiders defense, I'm not scared at all. I mean, uh, the Broncos defense should toast most opponents and the Raiders included. Jamal in the house, man. It's been a while indeed. Jamal Killings jumping in on Super Chat. Appreciate you, my friend. And he says, it's been a while. Just showing some love. We definitely appreciate you, my friend. It's good to see you. Welcome back. And we hope to see you more as we get into real football stuff happening at UC Health Training Center and then at the stadium. It's going to be a gas, my friend. Um, Let's also grab here Steve Baumgartner jumping in, showing us some love on Super Chat. Thank you, Steve. Bonafide superstar. You guys know him. You've met him on – I want to say he's the fifth segment we had on of our superstars. He says, Callahan, another good point. Glad you brought this up, Steve. Bryce Callahan has looked great in camp. So far, so good. In fact, Zach, Luke Patterson had an article, I think it was yesterday. Bryce Callahan has made many big splash plays, just like he did early in camp last year. If you, you guys can remember, Zach and I were covering training camp last year, and we were writing a lot about Bryce Callahan until he got his foot stepped on. And yeah, – we're telling you, if he's healthy, he's a Pro Bowl level impact type of player. Zach, we can only hope up to this point, though, that he stays healthy. Because if he does, right. I'm not worried that the production won't be there. Yeah, this is what we were saying. Bryce Callahan is a damn good football player, and he was first ascending in Chicago. He was a Pro Bowl caliber guy, like Chad just mentioned. He was, you know, the next Chris Harris Jr. in the NFL. He's a great slot cornerback. They're not easy to find. He has looked good in training camp so far, but all of us kind of have to walk on eggshells and hold our breath collectively that he's going to stay healthy. If he's healthy, Bryce Callahan will be more productive and a better corner than Chris Harris Jr. was last season. If he's not healthy, you know, the, the Broncos defensive depth in the secondary isn't great. They're in trouble again. But if as long as he's on the field, Chad, he's always making plays. That's why it was a good signing. That's why we all loved it at first, and we're waiting for him to just prove uh, what he can do with the Broncos. In Vic Fangio's system. All right, we got a superstar here, Dennis Woods, jumping in on Super Chat. The Thank stream you, jumped your your super card, so we can't show it. So we're doing it. We're reverse engineering it as we do because we don't leave any of our superstars out in the cold. Appreciate your support as always, my friend. He says, "So do you see Justin Sternod on the fifty three or on the practice squad to be brought up later?" No, 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 Zach. He's making the fifty three. Yeah. And he looks good in that 40 jersey. Like he he's long. You can see that he's got some athleticism to him, some twitch, some pop. He's deaf. I mean, I shouldn't say definitely. I see him making this 53. I see it as Todd Davis, Alexander Johnson, Josie Jewell, Justin Sternod, and probably Justin Hollins because he can do a couple of things. And depending on the roster math, maybe jo- uh, Joe Jones fits on there, maybe a Josh Watson. But I think Sternod, I wouldn't say he's virtually guaranteed, but nothing I've seen or heard. And then also just looking at the lay of the land and the roster math, he's making this this 53, barring some kind of rookie collapse. Yeah, I think Hollins, if they list him at outside linebacker, he might make the team there. Uh, yeah, he's. I think he has a pretty clear path to the roster. They will never get away with hiding him on the practice squad, Chad. I forget all the all the cockamamie rules for this kind of season uh, for the practice squad, but there's no way a team wouldn't want to sign him on their active roster or you know using him more prominently than the Broncos would. He will be on the 55, I think, this season. He might not start right away, but as the season goes on, he'll get better and better. Just for just for specificity's sake, I guess you hear me say the fifty three. Zach says the fifty five. So when <laughs> the roster when the roster comes out at the whatever it is, you know, it's going to be fifty three guys on the roster that are active, and then you got a sixteen man practice squad. The fifty five number for those of you keeping track here is that on game day the Broncos can flood their roster from fifty three to fifty five, bringing two guys off of the practice squad. And I know they increased the number, Zach, of game day actives. I can't remember what the figure is, though. It used to be 46 they could have active. So there was always seven guys that were a healthy scratch. 
they bumped that number. But the long story short is that gives coaches flexibility during the season where, you know, if they have a rash of injuries or the word that she'll go and mention rips through a depth chart or whatever, they can turn to the practice squad, activate those guys for game day. But those two guys, well, not necessarily those two guys after game day. So if you activated a guy, two guys on Sunday, Monday, you have to either send those two back down to the practice squad and get back to 53 or two other people to get back down to 53. So some moving parts this year are very different than is tradition, but I think it's good for the league, Zach. It gives coaches more flexibility. And some of these rules that they had for rosters and practice squads and, you know, active game day actives, they're very, they always seem very arbitrary to me. Yeah, it's, especially this year, it's very convoluted. And I've only been saying 55. I've been writing that so often, Chad. It's just kind of burned into my, my brain. It's kind of habit now. But, yeah, you, you laid it out pretty well. I think it's still 53 technically, but they have some uh, flexibility on game days. All right, so we are putting an open mailbag thread in our Facebook supporter group, and we opened it up here tonight. And Steve jumped in, Steve Griffith. I had to uh, shorten it here because there's only 200 characters are allowed in these banners. So I had to copy paste and I'm going to have to finish reading it here in its entirety. But here's Steve's question for tonight, Zach. Let me grab it here in in its fullness. He says, as training camp ramps up, there are multiple positions that will be battled for. Some positions are all but taken. Of these, though, could we see someone come up and take the starting job that might be presently overlooked. So, Zach, if there's anyone that's going to come out of nowhere and surprise and, you Ooh. know, vanquish a, an opponent, you know, teammate, but, com, you know, a competitor, I should say, not an opponent, and be a dark horse to steal a starting job that no one's really thinking about, who might that be? Number 30. I mean, that's off the top of my head. Philip Lindsay. That, I, I think a lot of Broncos fans are expecting that as well. I was going to say Devontae Bosby at cornerback, maybe over um, Michael Lowe. Not over Boye. He'd be the outside cornerback. Uh, other than that, I don't think uh, Albert O is going to jump over uh, Noah Fan. I don't think Patrick Morris is going to jump over, you know, uh, Cushenberry. I don't think Wilkins is going to steal the job over uh, Dotson. I think I'm going to go with Lindsey, Chad. Um, yeah, I don't think of anything off the top of my head right now. Can't think of anybody else. You know, Bosby, I think, is a pretty safe bet to be that dark horse. I mean, today he made some moves, some, some highlight real caliber plays, including an interception. I think he's the leader in the clubhouse to jump over some drafted guys, including Michael Ojemudia, who wouldn't surprise me if he ends up being this guy, the third corner onto the field. But I think it's going to be Bosby over guys like Isaac Yadam, over Ojemudia, and other highly drafted guys, even though Duke Dawson wasn't drafted by the Broncos. He is a former second-round pick of the Patriots. And I think you're going to see Boz be that guy. Another name to look out for is Draymond Jones. Wouldn't completely shock me to see him leapfrog Shelby Harris at some point this season, but it wouldn't happen, I don't think, until actual football is getting played. I just have a feeling about him. And uh, so there's three names for you, my friend. Let's grab another one here from Glenn Hauser, bona fide superstar. Everyone Thank knows you, Glenn. Glenn. He says, awesome. Oh, there it is. Thanks, John. Awesome, Mike. Don't be shocked when KP shows up at your house, Kevin Peterson, <laughs> with the tailgate tent now that we know where you live. Hashtag hide, hide. hashtag state of B, MHH, and hashtag your dad. Very cool. Appreciate that, Glenn. You the man. And uh, oh, let me get that off. There we go. Appreciate you, my friend. Okay. Let me see what else we've got here. And James, some kind words here for Mike as well. He says, awesome job, Mike. Always appreciate your input. And really appreciate your local insight and thoughts on the O-line from your unique experience. Appreciate that, James. And I know Mike does. All right, let me see. Where are we at? We're at 53 minutes, so we got to start winding it down here. Um, What's this? Uh, Elvis, that one, I can't quite make out what you're asking for there in your question, Elvis. Sorry, my friend. Um, Appreciate you, Steve. He jumps in uh, with the Callahan thing. Yes, indeed. He has looked good. Uh, Mundungus, the wizard, jumps back in. Appreciate you. Thank you. As always, and that's very generous of you, my friend. And I've heard a little birdie has whispered to me that some community members here in the stream might be coming up with a fan podcast of their own in the very near future, and we look forward to hearing more details on that as they unfold. Maybe Mundungus might be involved, and you all know Mundungus. He was on the show last week. Anyway, he says, Garrett Bowles, everyone hates me. I'm the most hated tackle in Denver. Jawan James, hold my beer. 
Mundungus Creepy. <laughs> Find your eyebrows first. <laughs> yeah. I've started I've never been, with, it's I've never been with, happier to have eyebrows, Chad, in my life. I know. First it was Mark Langley and the toilet bowls, then it yeah. became girth. And now we've got the whole eyebrows thing. <laughs> it's just we need some we need levity though. Football can be a very serious enterprise and we need a, a little levity in the house, you know? I don't know why no eyebrows were so funny, but all the different ways we can roast Jawan James over his softness shed and his uh, lack of expression on his face. It's just, uh, it's, <laughs> it cracks me up. All right. We got Dennis jumping back in. Appreciate you, my friend. Thank you, Dennis. He says, uh, could it be that the staff knows who will be the starters, i.e. Cushionberry, but they're giving the others reps to see he'll be the backups. Very possible. That all plays a part in the equation. But again, a lot of these early seats at the table – are posturing. A coach has to be able to, with a straight face, whether it's in a group meeting or individual meeting or a one-on-one meeting, he has to be able to stand up there and say, the best guys are going to play. The best guys, the guys who give us the best chance to win are going to play. Cushionberry, you know, he's looked good in the second team. Everything I've seen and everything I've heard, he's looked good. It's only a matter of time, Zach, before Cush gets his, his opportunity with the ones. I, but here's what I say to that, Chad. Is Drew Law competing for a starting job? Is Bradley Chubb, Von Miller? I mean, why is it just Cushenberry who has to take the back seat to Jags and guys that are less talented than he is? I mean, he was a third round pick. He's obviously the future at the position. They don't have a center that can, that can hold his jock, all things considered on the roster. I don't know why they're playing around. He's the quarterback off the offensive line. You're starting a raw quarterback in his first full starting season. Why not get down the continuity and chemistry as soon as possible? You want all the reps ASAP in this kind of ruined offseason. So I, I don't understand that. Elvis is wondering, he says, any fans for week one? I He's got a flight, but he's not sure if fans are going to be allowed. So far, Elvis, we just don't have an answer on that yet, unfortunately, my friend. We just don't know. I would – Bet money, there's not going to be fans in the stands initially. Probably the first quarter of the season for sure. Cody Potter, jumping back in. Appreciate you, my Thank friend. You, Cody. Good to have you. And, Cody, if you're on Twitter, make sure you reach out and let me know who you are so that we can connect, man. You've been really active on Super Chat, and we'd like to be able to tag you on Twitter and show you some love after these podcasts. But he says, week one, September 14th, it's my birthday. Broncos need to bring one home for me. LOL. Does Jarrell Casey have a breakout revenge game week one, or does he create holes for the edge? Hashtag mile high salute to you. Right back at you, Cody. You know what, Zach? If there was a, some kind of a prop bet on Jarrell Casey having a big game <laughs> in his debut as a Bronco, I would take that because I think he's got a little something cooking for his former team that very abruptly, very surprisingly, not only traded him, just, I mean, came out of nowhere. But seventh for, round pick. Was, yes. God, I mean, I, he should be fired up for this contest. Maybe I'm being dramatic about it, Chad, but I see him wrecking Ryan Tannehill and forcing like a game-changing sack fumble that the Broncos capitalize on. He's going to have a big season in Denver, but he's going to show week one why the Titans never should have got rid of a five-time Pro Bowler for a seventh round draft pick. I am excited to see what he's going to do against the Titans in week one. All right, our friend Adon jumping in to bring up another storyline that's worth some time here before we get out of here for tonight. He says, Drew Locke's footwork <clears throat> is improving, and with time, he will get better. He threw a bomb pass to Sutton today. Yes, he did connect on a deep ball. He connected. He's connected on some big plays, is Drew Locke. And what I like and what I'm hearing people telling me is that he is throwing into small windows. He's pushing the ball. As we talked about, I think it was last week, might have been the week before, that article or uh, video by Brett Coleman, who does great film work on YouTube, really questioned why Drew Locke, those final three games especially, seemed to go in a very conservative shell. Zach and I attribute it to the coaching he was receiving from Rich Scangarello. I think what you're seeing from Locke here in training camp is a good example that kind of bolsters what we're saying here, kind of backs us up. Drew Locke's natural disposition is to be a gunslinger and push the ball. And uh, for him to – mute that tendency it comes from coaches it's only his bosses as it were that are going to mute that natural tendency to to push the ball and strive to make big plays and yes adon we're hearing the same that his footwork looks vastly improved so far 
Yeah, this is the thing with Drew Locke. If you're expecting Alex Smith or Case Keenum or some check down artist, you're never going to get that type of quarterback. It's not who Locke is, and the Broncos shouldn't fit a square peg into a round hole with him. Let him be Drew Locke. He's going to take some chances down the field. He's going to throw some picks. He had two interceptions in the first practice, Chad. Then he comes back and, and hooks up a Cortland Sutton for a long touchdown pass. It's the good and the bad. How many picks did Brett Favre throw in his career? Tony Romo. There are natural risk takers and gunslingers that's the type of quarterback you want that's who they drafted and that's who they're getting well said zeus in the house (laughs) down in texas now no longer in the pacific northwest appreciate your generosity as always mhh mount rushmore member he says hi all sorry in the middle of my move so i haven't been on every night but always thinking broncos football thanks for keeping us updated you got it Stu, appreciate you, my friend, and hope everything's gone okay, settling in with your – hopefully you're actually into your new home down there. I know you were temporarily displaced, waiting to close, and all that goes with buying a a home. But hope everything went well in your move, my friend. Yeah, I just hope you could stay cool as well. I heard that the heat down in Texas is unbearable right now, so hope all is well. All right, we got Chris Hernandez, who is going to be on the show not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, August 26. We can't wait to talk with you, Chris. Appreciate your support as always. Thank you, Chris. He said he can't stay, but stop by to remind everybody, click, click those, those little thumbs up. Appreciate the support and the reminders as always, my brother. Ron Dub, I'm, a, I'm guessing we got a pretty good question coming <laughs> by virtue of it being Ron Dub. Appreciate your support Thank as you, Ron. always, Ron. He says, hey, guys, which opposing corner and or safety? Would you predict having an ankle <laughs> injury as a result of Judy's nasty route running? LOL. I can, I how can about, think of one. How about Josie Jewell? It was Josie Jewell who garnered the the short end of that stick on Friday. It was kind of posterized by the rookies. Act. Yeah, opposing corner, though, I'm going Chris Harris Jr. I, that is going to be, I think everyone's guessing that, but he's going to get his ankle snapped by KJ Hamler and Jerry Judy. So, Chris Harris, can't wait to see you. By the way, speaking of Chris Harris, I watched the first episode of the new Hard Knocks uh, just this weekend. I know it came out, I think, last Monday or Tuesday. And uh, there's a little bit of Chris Harris action in that because this year, of course, they're following two teams, both of the L.A. teams. And Chris now hangs his hat with the Los Angeles Chargers. And that laugh, here's what I'll say. Look, he botched his the way his career could have ended in Denver. Broncos offered him that $12 million a year a contract extension last fall. He passed on it, ended up having to take way less to sign with the Chargers. Wish it would have ended different for him. But I'm still, I think, going to miss covering this guy because not only was he good on the field when he was put in the right position by coaches, but that laugh of his is so obnoxious and <laughs> infectious, and you get to hear it on on Hard Knocks. That <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. But, yeah, check it out, gang. We need to have Mundungus to go in on Chris Harris Jr.'s laugh. That's next. Uh, <laughs> Poor impression by me, but uh, still, you guys go check it out. All right, we got Danny Trahill in the house on Facebook. Appreciate our Facebook community. He says, the pads go on tomorrow, so what should we expect? Now, some fans might go, wait a minute. I saw pads today when I was watching. There's a difference between helmets, shells, and pads. The full pads are going on tomorrow, and what you can expect is a little more context. So, for example, we kind of – clowned a little bit on the offensive line struggles these first two days. But it's not till tomorrow when the real pa- the pads go on and the real contact can happen. Now, tackling is never going to go to the ground in training camp and hits on the quarterback are no-no. But in terms of the actual uh, coalescing, the, the actual action that takes place at the point of attack between an offensive and defensive line, that hap- that really begins tomorrow when the pads go on. From tomorrow on, Zach, when they go into full pads is when we should really start to be able to get a more accurate feel for how this offensive line is shaking out. Now the initial returns at certain positions aren't too encouraging, but that's why we can't draw complete conclusions quite yet because the full pads haven't gone on, which means the full contact hasn't gone on. And how can you really judge offensive line without full contact? Yeah, perfectly said. And with padded practices comes my favorite part of padded practices, and that's goal line drills. I want to see if Melvin Gordon is this goal line back. I want to see the offensive line get pushed against the Broncos defense. Mono a mano, offense versus D, one yard to go. Who's going to win? I love to see that in uh, the, the padded, padded practices. 
BG in the house, showing some love on Super Chat. We love you too, my friend. Appreciate Thanks. that support as always. Shout out to the Jordan, who spells his name with a G. Very unique name on Periscope on Twitter. Good to have you, my friend. Um, all right. We are about out of time. So let me – Zach, we're four minutes over. <clears throat> so let us – Rapid fire. We don't leave any of our superstars out in the cold ever. We get them all. And let me scroll up here and grab. Okay. A few of these we've gotten. Hey, there's Pobby on Facebook. Good to see you. Also, everyone knows Pobby, big time superstar on Super Chat, but also a supporter on Facebook. She just supports MHH every way possible. And we appreciate you. Thanks for being with us. All right. So there's, excuse me, there's Jamal. Then let me jump from Jamal to Jess. Appreciate your super chat, my friend. He says, we need to make the playoffs. It's been too long. Hey, man, you're, there's no one in this room right now that's going to give you a nay to that. And that's going to end this season. The drought is ending. Okay, Nishan has another question. Thank you for the super chat, Nishan, again. And, Nishan, if you're on Twitter, remember, reach out so we can connect. He says, hey, guys, do you see Jerry Judy at some point during the season becoming a true number one over Sutton, hashtag Broncos in New Jersey. Zach, this was something you wrote about in one of your most recent Kelberman Corner mailbags. Why don't you take it? Yeah, you know, it, can Jerry Judy make Cortland Sutton expendable? And, and the Broncos didn't draft Jerry Judy, and they were not going to pay Cortland Sutton only to dis- dismantle that a couple of years down the road. They envision a true tandem at wide receiver, a, a great one-two punch, two number one wide receivers who can complement each other really well. Jerry Judy does things that Sutton can't do, and Sutton does things that Jerry Judy can't do. I'm not worried about titles, Chad, who's going to be where. I'm worried about them making plays and helping the Broncos win football games. And you're getting one of the best receivers in an historically deep draft class. You have a bona fide top 10 guy, future all pro in Cortland Sutton. It's exciting. So I'm not worried about titles, number one, number two, who's going to be better. They're both great in their own right, and they're going to be around in Denver for quite a while. Well said. Terry, jumping back in. Appreciate your support, my friend, as always. He says just hashtag football priest, hashtag state of being, hashtag Broncos world, and Mike Evans smashing it. Um, and he did. He's peace and prayers, Broncos country. Love you, buddy. Appreciate you, Terry. We got BG as well jumping back in on Super Chat to say, thank you, thank you Bri. If Drew Locke is what we all believe he is, we should sweep the Raiders and the Chargers for sure. Thoughts? You know, it's fun. It's easy to say that, like, but you got to remember those Peyton years where everyone got swept. The AFC, he just, I think he had one loss in the AFC West, all those, those four years he was in Denver. That was the exception. Even John Elway during the years he was in Denver, he very rarely swept the AFC West. Why? It's not because your opponents in division are always, you know, so good. It's that when it comes to divisional matchups, everyone knows each other so well. Sometimes it's a coin flip. Just, you know, all bets are off. It's really when the whole any given Sunday cliche really becomes true, Zach. Yeah, you, you can't script these things. The NFL has so much parity, not just from year to year, but week to week. Here's what Drew Locke can do, though. It, not in terms of a game-by-game prediction. If he develops on schedule, the Broncos will beat the teams they're supposed to beat, meaning the Dolphins, the Chargers, the Raiders, and they will even beat the teams they're not supposed to beat. I'm not saying 16-0. I'm not saying sweeping Kansas City. I'm not even saying AFC champions, but they're going to beat the teams they're supposed to, and they're going to end up with a 10-6 and record or so, and that that's what you should want from Locke. Not to, they already swept the Chargers last year, so they're capable of that either way. But to look at it like in that vacuum, I think is inaccurate. If you look at just the whole picture of Locke being a franchise quarterback, if he is is what the Broncos think, they're going to win a lot more games. They're going to lose, and that's the most important thing. BG jumping back in to say Michael Ojemudia is his pick for being a dark horse to as I think it was Steve Griffith had that question to take a starting spot. And he says, Lindsey's the starter. Come on, Zach, dark horse. Ha ha. He is for now, but they're splitting reps almost exactly 50-50. Like you can't pick which one has the edge right now between he and Melvin Gordon. Um, Derek Green, good to see you, my friend. Jumping in on Super Chat. Appreciate you. Appreciate you and your misses. He says, I'd be hurt if the Broncos traded Lindsey, which is something we floated as a tinfoil hat possibility idea. We don't think it's going to happen, but as a – as a dim, dim, dim likelihood, Derek's saying you'd be hurt if the Broncos traded Lindsey. It would be a dagger to the heart. 
He says, but if they did, what would you like to see us get for him in a trade? Hashtag hope it doesn't happen. Man, that's hard to say because, you know, former college free agent, but a pro bowler and a back-to-back thousand-yard rusher, no no less than a fourth-round pick, I would say, Zach, no less. And that doesn't sound like much, but remember, Aqib Tlaib, what, what would the Broncos get? Fifth-round pick for Aqib Tlaib, who was a 10-year proven guy when he got dealt. So I don't think it's something we really need to seriously ponder, but it won't be as much as you think he's worth in your heart. Right. I don't even want to entertain this question, Chad. I hate the possibility or the idea of the Broncos trading Philip Lindsay because it wouldn't just devastate the fan base. It would devastate the Broncos locker room. A homegrown stud has been so good for them. But in terms of what they would get back for him, the NFL has devalued running backs. The Broncos proved that this offseason by signing another one. So I'm with you. I think a third, fourth round pick, maybe conditional pick in that in that area would be what Philip Lindsay could return. Not a first rounder by any means. Also, Jess, CO13 Sports, if you're on Twitter, reach out. Let me know what your handle is, my friend. Uh, George jumping back in, showing that mile-high generosity and that state of being generosity. He says, I won't be here live till next Sunday. I wish our beloved Broncos country family a great week. Chad and Zach, a mile-high salute to you, as you two are the best at what you do. Very kind of you, you, George. George. And you know we love you, my friend. And it's good being connected with you on social media because even during the week where we only get to see and talk with you on a Sunday night, we get to kind of keep in touch on Facebook. So, But, Zach, just phenomenal generosity from from George. Yeah, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday, George. Take care until then, and thank you. We're running out of time, so i got to kind of mosey through these. Uh, Edward jumping back in. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Appreciate you, dog. He says, I agree with Zach. We need to just get Cushenberry and Dotson in to build chemistry with Locke, Denver Broncos for life, hashtag state of being. The sooner they get around to it, the better. Um, But they're going to take their whatever time they have allotted for that. The coaches are going to take it. Again, it's about credibility. It's about posturing. The best guys will get on the field. And so far, Schlopman hasn't impressed anybody. Neither has Patrick Morrison. If today was any incl- any uh, harbinger, Zach, Wilkinson is not looking good at right tackle. Shocker. It, it's just funny that the every move the Broncos made this offseason w- was with Drew Locke in mind. Now this is the last move they have to make is getting these guys in the starting lineup, and they're not doing it. Just go through with it. You, you drafted one guy. You signed another. You obviously think they're starters and upgrades on what you have. Just put them in the lineup. Let, let's not waste any more time. Our friend Brooks Austin, our colleague on the SI Sports Illustrated um, Publisher Network, publishes the Georgia Bulldogs site for Sports Illustrated. And uh, so if any of our Broncos country members in the community are also Georgia Bulldog fans, you probably already know full well who Brooks Austin is. But if not, check out his work. Appreciate you, dog. Thank you. All right. Mundungus jumping back in. He says, I've got you, Zach. Chris Uh Harris Jr. jokes will commence Tomorrow. I can't wait to see what he's got cooked up. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you, Mundungus. Appreciate you, dog. All right, we are really out of time, but we don't leave anyone out in the cold, so let's – there he is, (laughs) Mundungus, just so you can't leave yet. Very devious. (laughs) All right, let's see. Okay, we got BG. Appreciate you, my friend. He says, no way. Our O-line holds our defense – no way. Our O line holds our D. I would honestly be upset if they could. Our D line should be stout against most O lines. I agree true. with that. And I honestly think the offensive line will, when it all comes out in the wash, when it's all said and done, Zach, I think that offensive line of the Denver Broncos is going to end up being a lot better than it feels like they are right now. Don't jump to conclusions yet. It's early days of camp. Yes, when they all gel, maybe by midseason, Chad, they're going to be, I, I wouldn't say top 10 or top 5, but maybe top 12, top 13. And what we've been saying, if we can get that with this offense and this defense, uh, they're going to be in excellent, excellent shape. Hugis, jumping in. Appreciate you, my friend. Showing some love on Super Chat as we're about to sign off. He says, just wanted to show some love from South Dakota. Go Broncos. Hashtag state of being. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Very sweet, my friend. Really Thank appreciate you. that. Yeah. Uh, GTZ. Okay. That's a further chat. All right. Good. All right. We're about out of time here, John. Oh, my, our friend, John, the over the road truck driver, keeping the supply chain fat. And uh, we really appreciate you as always, my buddy. 
He says, caught the tail end. You guys are rocking. Appreciate that. And just remember, you can always hop back in these live streams and just dial it back or wait till it's fully done streaming and go back and watch the whole thing. If whatever you missed, my friend. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Dale, our friend in paradise in Hawaii, showing that generosity that he is known for here within the community. He might not be in every single stream, but when he's in the stream, he's affecting the conversation and he's shown massive love and support in what we do here at MHA in the biggest way. So Dale, love you, my friend. He says, great to be here, gents. I think every team is going to have growing pains in the early games simply due to the lack of a true off season. However, I'm pumped that the defense is turning the ball over early and off or early on and getting the rush going Broncos for life. Wow. Dale, thank you so much, my friend. I mean, so we hope that we don't ever sound disingenuous because it really does move us and it motivates us, your support and all of our superstars and the way and our Facebook supporters that and that's a newer thing, but all of you guys, it motivates us to keep bringing you this content when we're tired or when there's, maybe something to be done in our yard or we got to go to the gym. We put that on ice to be here for you guys and keep bringing you this content. So Dale, love you, my friend. And thank you as always. Yeah, that's it, it, remarkably incredible. And I agree with what you're saying. And, and the defense in off seasons is, is traditionally ahead of the offense by this point, Chad. So it's not surprising that the, the defense is causing more problems for Drew Locke and company. But as time goes on, that'll level out and you'll see good production from both sides. But thank you so much again. That's incredible. All right, we got another one from uh, Mundungus trying to keep us in the saddle here. And then he gets us again. Hi, guys. <laughs> keep, <laughs> keeping us working. Some wizardry anyway, right there. Thank you, my friends. You know, we love you. We appreciate you. And uh, as John, as Buona Beast is pointing out here, reach out to Mike Evans. You follow him on Twitter at DM Evans 32 for more takes. Really knows his stuff. And we all, I echo John, love meeting him. Highly suggest asking him a question for another view so shout out to mike much love to you my friend and uh, we look forward to getting you back on the show again but that's got to do it for tonight my friends thank you for joining us each and every one of you and a mile high salute to our super chat superstars you know we love you we got to get out of here though quick reminder make sure you follow the podcast on twitter at huddle up pod and while you're at it follow at mile high huddle and my partner zach kelberman at kelberman nfl on twitter and myself, Matt, Chad, and Jensen, <laughs> my dumbest man, keeping the flame alive. Love you, buddy. And uh, John, you want to follow our producer, John Cronenberg, at right. John K. That's K-A-Y-M-H-H. All right, gang, we got to get out of here for tonight. And then tomorrow, Zach, the pads go on. So I imagine we're going to have a lot to talk about Monday night. Yes, sir. We got Mundungus' Chris Harris Jr. jokes to look forward to as well. So see you yeah. all then. All right, gang. Love you. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. And also for Mike and for John. Much love, BG. (laughs) There he is. Much love. But for Zach, I'm Chad. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow night. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.